Large metallic footsteps are heard as you see a warrior in a power suit challenging an alien-like creature that summons a horde of monsters. The lone soldier starts letting off lead into the endless wave, trying to take out as many as he can. The smoke clears and the stressed soldier knows he won't be able to get out of this. In front of his eyes, a huge dragon starts to fly at him. Knowing his end is near, he drops his weapon, but his suit catches fire, and in the flames, a man wakes up. It seems he has this nightmare frequently. He slicks his hair back, now worried on the day ahead. The last bunch of recruits are arriving. We shift to a plane and see a young boy strapped to the seat. Han Lee is his name, and he is the leader of an orphan gang, and his age surprises the military officials. They tell the kid not to worry, he won't be sent to jail, but asks if he heard of a place called Ark. Han is aware that this is a training facility for psychers, and psyker is a name for those in this world who possess a special ability. The Major tells Han that he has this ability, and he won't have to worry about a place to sleep or food on his plate, as long as he trains his ability for the good of mankind. But Han's rage starts to show, only I will eat. What about the other kids? Han will only accept this proposal if the Major accepts to provide for the other children. He agrees as long as Han remains at Ark as a Psyker. Han agrees and now we fast forward to his arrival at this so-called academy. Psykers have different ranking abilities and right now Han is a low rank. And this academy isn't easy, so he will need to fight to survive, especially if he cares about those other kids. He arrives at a tall building, clenching his fist in anticipation, but a commotion is heard from behind him. As he turns to see a crowd forming, a boy is bullying a young kid, telling him to go back where he came from. Tears stream down his face and the bully tells the kid that he's too weak to be here, they're not on the same level. A group of kids tries to talk shit to the bully, but he just flares up his powers. He's a trained psyker. What the hell are you guys going to do about it? This display makes all of the kids shit themselves and the bully holds up a rock with his telekinesis, telling the young boy that maybe he will be sent back if he's injured enough. Don't worry, you'll thank me later. But as he hurls this rock at the defenseless boy, Han comes in and grabs it with one hand, commenting on how slow it was traveling. It would have been faster if you just threw it. The bully gets angry wanting to know who the hell Han thinks he is, and now a fight is brewing. But before the two kids can do any damage, an officer approaches, telling these fools to knock it off, and asks for the two to step forward. The grizzled instructor asks for the names, and the bully quickly gets informed. Del Simon, sir. Han introduces himself as well, and the officer asks Del if his special traits have manifested, and so far, he can only use telekinesis. Han is interested, special traits, the hell does that even mean? The officer stops for a second, but unleashes a hellish gut punch on the brat. So you only had one power manifest, and you were showing it off, huh? And damn, this guy does not fuck around. He just laid Simon out just like that. The officer looks towards Han, and he actually likes that he stepped up to help the boy. But if you don't have any abilities, then you're worse than Simon, and he punches Han back a few meters. He tells all of the young recruits that they have three weeks to become first years, and if they don't learn telekinesis by then, they will be expelled. The officer introduces himself as the kid's instructor, John Red, and he will turn these punks into knights, ready to fight dragons. Now that introductions are out of the way, it's time to begin. Some time passes and we see Han running on a track. Some kids are struggling to keep up, but John doesn't have any time for these pussies, and he yells at them to get up. Get the hell out of here and go home if you can't handle this. Han runs and thinks that he can withstand all the physical pain, but he's worried about his psychic abilities manifesting. Will he even have them? The kid who was bullied earlier starts to faint. As he's running, he hits the floor, and John stands over him. If you plan to sleep, do it at home. The kid tries to say he can't run anymore, but Han comes in and lifts him up. Han tells the instructor that the boy didn't give up, as he looks towards him, right? Han begins helping the boy finish the exercise, and soon after, John blows the whistle. All of the kids are exhausted, and out of the 73, only 40 remain. Every morning, they will start their day off with a jog like this, and all the kids are horrified at this news. And the next day comes, and the same 5 a.m. morning run was held. And this is the start of Han's training. At 8, they were served breakfast, and at 9, they started morning classes, where John would lecture the group on how to utilize their powers. Pick a body part and visualize power coming from it. The most important step in manifesting is visualization. Han thinks he will use his heart in this exercise, but nothing seems to happen. We shift to 12.30 and it's lunchtime, and Han sits next to Kuro, the kid that he helped. And it seems that this is his only friend that he's ever had. But standing over him is Simon, giving him an evil stare. The kid walks away and Kuro says that apparently, Simon is from a gifted program in England. Han doesn't like him, but if they can't use abilities like he can, they're going to be kicked out. But to Han's surprise, Kuro can actually already use telekinesis. Han realizes that he doesn't have time to worry about someone else. 
We shift to the evening and the kids have more lessons and combat training, and to finish it off, an evening run. After this, they shower and get in bed by 10 p.m. Han is in his bed but can't sleep. The living quarters isn't something crazy and much better than what he had before, but his mind tries to sway him to go home. But he has to stay strong. Two weeks pass and more and more kids were unlocking their powers. But still, Han has no luck. He knows he has one option and asks Simon for advice. He approaches Simon and the cocky kid asks what he wants. Han tells him that he knows exactly why he's here. But Simon begins to laugh. So you want to learn telekinesis, huh? Well, I heard where you're from, they care about manners. So how about you ask nicely? Han puts his pride to the side and gets on his knees, asking again for Simon to please teach him. The boy sighs and agrees to help, and he grabs a pencil and immediately stabs at Han's chest. We shift to John being a usual Chad smoking outside a window, and he can't believe that it's a Simon day. But some guy opens a door, saying that he knew John would be here. John greets the man, Octo, and he sits down, asking about the new recruits. John just says they're all useless punks, but Octo doesn't believe him. John says that there is one or two decent kids. That Del Simon kid isn't half bad, but he's a prick. Octo is interested in Simon's growth, and the other kid is Han. He's very loyal, and in terms of the heart, he is the best out of all the recruits. He'd be a perfect soldier. But Ark is looking for superhumans, not regular people. If he can't use abilities, he can't stay here. Octo is interested and jokes around, asking if John knows the nickname that the kids gave him. John isn't interested and is probably something bad, but shortly after, we shift to the training field. As John looks at all of the recruits, today, those among the recruits who can use their powers will be admitted as first years. Kuro looks over, worried for Han. The most basic psychic skill is external manifestation. This means one's power will be visible from the glow in their eyes. Telekinesis is not technically required, but if you can hold this glow, you will be able to continue. Those who can do external manifestation are ordered to do so in front of Octo, the technician of the school, and those who can't have to go with the agent to be escorted home. Han sees the major and knows the kids that he's taking care of have their futures on the line. Tens of kids are rejected almost immediately, making them leave in tears, and Han's turn is slowly approaching. Kuro looks back as Han grips his heart, and we shift back to him being stabbed by Simon. He drops asking if Simon is crazy. Are you trying to kill me? Simon tells Han to relax. That wound is your psychic pathway. Gather your energy through that hole. This isn't something you can get by holding on to your chest and concentrating. And Simon already knew Han was using this as his core. But since that day, Han has been feeling psychic energy. It was only faint at first, but every day that passed, it grew more and more. But Han still can't release it. Now his name is called and he stands in the field with his hand over his heart, quickly trying to find a solution. He has to do this no matter what. John is getting impatient and slams his foot down. All of the kids are terrified as John walks up to Han, telling him that a commander's orders are absolute, no exceptions. But as John winds back a punch, Han desperately tries to think of something. But then it hits him as he sees a pen in John's shirt pocket. Han is sent flying but gets up with John's pen surprising the commander. How did you take that? Han raises the pen, and if this pathway is too narrow, he has to open it himself, as he raises his hand, stabbing himself in the chest. John grabs him and the pen drops, with the blood splattering down. Han's face fills with tears, but his eyes begin to glow. John sees this and sighs, letting Han go. He's never seen a less talented kid, but congratulations, you passed Han Lee. Han grips his heart determined. He's finally at the starting line. Kuro runs up asking if Han's okay. And the boy says that he's fine, don't worry about it. Octo gets excited and tells him that as a token of his success, here's a bracelet. And he slaps it on his wrist. Han is taken aback, but this is the latest technology advancement of ARC. A bracelet shaped device that has an AI. User verification, Lee Han, trainee soldier. Han is amazed and Octo starts bragging because I guess he got a hand in making it. John interrupts the party telling everyone to come to attention. The class assignment will be completed soon, and everyone is ordered to gather according to their class. The ARC's grade is divided into an A to D ranking. Take your classes according to your ability. The assignment is the result of the first three weeks of training, but please be aware that you can be promoted and demoted at any time, depending on your skills. And to the 25 people that remain, congratulations on your transfer. All of you must have thought that I was a real son of a bitch up until now, but let me correct your misunderstanding. I'm not merely a son of a bitch. I'm the fucking son of a bitch. And damn, John's a beast. I love him. In class A is one person, Simon. In class B are four people, including Kuro. And the five kids will go with John. The rest are divided into C and D, and Han is placed in D. He thinks to himself that he'll climb as soon as he can. And the 20 people in classes C and D will go with the instructor here. This menacing man stands tall and scares all the kids, but 
he has a soft smile, contradictory to his friend John. He tells the kids that he's going to do their best, and he's going to be their instructor from here on out. This shocks them again that this guy is so kind, and he's trying to warm their hearts. Maybe he's setting them up. The kids start moving out, and Simon walks past Han. Han looks at Kuro, crying as he's walking off, and tells him not to worry. He's going to join him pretty soon. Instructor Wei tells everyone that they're going to move to the gym. Now we shift to this large training area, and we see Wei using a training spear, swinging it in all sorts of different directions. He finishes his move set, and everyone is left in awe. He continues slashing around the spear, and Han is keen and watching. Wei stops and asks the cadets if they know the reason why they train with spears and blades, even though they fight dragons. The reason lies in the psychic equipment that they will use. There's no substance on earth that can store this energy, but the dragon's skin and bones contain and transmit the same energy. And thus, weapons made from killing dragons can also deal fatal injuries to them. Han questions how they even got a hold of these weapons if they didn't have them in the beginning when they fought the dragons. Wei's expression changes, and he said in the beginning, it was only hand-to-hand -hand combat and a single dragon killed hundreds of psychers. There are psychers that fight from range, but the first person to kill a dragon did it from melee range. And these psychers who fight in this area are called strikers. The kids are alerted to this cool sounding name, and Wei points to the weapons, saying that they're going to try out the spear for today. Han holds his spear, and Wei comes up to him, asking if he prefers it. Han says he does, and says that he liked the way that Wei was spinning it around. It felt really cool, and he liked the sound of it too. Wei looks over at Han, and knows the bravery and judgment that he showed to Sergeant Red wasn't ordinary. And he's sure that this kid has been living in an extreme situation, and already he's got a knack for combat. Wei tells Han to let's do their best, and he's going to help him as much as he can. We shift to two weeks later, and Han is seen sparring with another one of the kids, Jose. Han tells him that the kid looks tired, so he should just surrender. But Jose doesn't seem on backing down, and sends a spear thrust right at Han that he barely manages to dodge. The two engage, and Han now has the upper hand, and swings Jose's spear out of his hand. Today is the second week of the first year, and after class... And after defeating Jose, Han has finally defeated all of the students in class. Han thanks Jose for the spar and he learned the lesson today. Jose smiles at him and knows that he's being promoted to class C next and tells Han that he better be the next class president. Han is surprised and doesn't know if he really wants to, but Jose points to the kids behind him and tells Han that they're all already disgusted amongst themselves and they're going to follow him. Han just thanks everyone awkwardly and nighttime comes. He wonders what it would be like to be promoted to the class president. He wonders what it's like to be promoted to the class president. But as soon as he goes up to John, John gets angry and tells him that he can't. We see some older students talking about John, reminiscing about how he always used to beat their ass. But they look out the window to see him sparring Han, who's holding a spear. John ignites his hand and lights his cigars. The older cadets are cheering Han on, and John overhears this and gets annoyed. But Han is gleaming determination. We get a flashback to Han volunteering to be the class leader. John makes fun of this since no one else wanted to step up, but sighs, knowing that there must be some sort of reason the class trusts him. John slams a stick into the ground and throws Han a makeshift spear. John has heard that he is the top of the class in weapons training, and now it's time to show what he's learned. We shift back to the present, and John takes off his jacket, ready to go. Han asks where his weapon is, but it wouldn't be fair if they were on equal footing, so Han will have a handicap. He will win if any part of John's body touches the ground, and Han will lose if he surrenders. Han smiles, and this is more winnable than he thought. He begins twirling his spear, and John sets up his stance. The kids watch on, wondering how Han will manage to defeat the instructor. Simon peeks out of the window at his rival, but Han rushes into John with a spear stab. John is seeing through the movements and dodging each strike. Han leaps into the air, trying to pierce John, but is met in midair. He's grabbed and kneed in the stomach. There's no time to rest as John's foot is coming down onto Han. He manages to regain himself and dashes back. He uses his spear to hold himself up, startled. Is this man really trying to kill me? John reads Han's face, and he's doing this on purpose to prepare the young boy's mind. Monsters don't give any sympathy and they will kill indiscriminately. Han gets up and asks John if he fights with his mouth, but John doesn't answer, and grabs Han by the shirt and hurls him into the air. Han comes crashing down, hitting his head, but Han managed to land a strike on John, slicing his cheek. The boys start cheering for their leader as Han rushes in again. John is now impressed and wants to see what Han can really do. He dodges the first stab, but notices that Han dashed behind him. He's using his own momentum to accelerate his attacks. No wonder the Major is so fond of this kid. John smiles with anticipation, and Han takes a step. He spins his spear, creating a huge force, 
but John stands still, ready to meet the strike head on. The spear snaps into pieces, and one pierces John's chest, but he pulls it out with a murderous intent. Han now feels hopeless, and he's grabbed by the neck. John tells him to give it up. Surrender. It's over. John's hand starts to heat up, causing Han to scream in agony. Surrender or die, boy. Han still refuses to utter the word, and John continues to heat up, but Instructor Wei yells for him to stop. What are you, crazy? John releases his grip, and it seems the two are competitive. Neither wants to lose. Instructor Wei grabs Han, looking at John, disgusted with his teaching methods. John yells at the top of his lungs, telling this man to shut up. Today, Han won, but nothing will be gained by your cuddling. As John is leaving, he says that Han has proved his worth, and when he recovers, send him to Class B. We go to a new building as a girl is walking with John, shocked that he let Han into Class B, jumping all the way from D. No way the higher-ups will be okay with this. John says that Han's skill are actually better than Class B, but his psychic abilities are holding him back. The girl reminds John that at Ark, all they care about is psychic ability. But John thinks that the most important trait for hunting dragons isn't psychic power, but the ability to stand in front of unimaginable fear. Han Lee has potential to become the best striker Ark has ever seen. It would be wise not to waste his talents, regardless of his psychic powers. Who knows, he might even save the world one day. The girl is surprised to hear this praise. She always thought that John hated Han, but she's informed that it's quite the opposite, which makes her think that John has a weird way of showing love. The same girl walks to visit Han in the hospital room and spots Instructor Wei, trying to visit him again, bringing all sorts of snacks. The two take a peek inside, wondering if it's a good time, but they see Han practicing his telekinesis. He's struggling, but soon he's able to lift a marble without touching it. Both adults outside get excited and high five, but it gets a little awkward. Wei enters, asking how Han is feeling. Han says that he's feeling great actually, and Wei informs him that he'll join class B tomorrow. Wei is proud of Han's progress. He even learned telekinesis. Han, however, knows his psychic abilities are below average, so he figured while he was in the hospital, he would try to learn at least this technique. Wei is happy about Han's mentality. He must train his powers. Most battles with dragons take place in midair, and you need to be able to at least get your weapon if it drops. Wei has an idea and asks the receptionist if he can take Han out for a little bit. The two are walking outside and Han asks where they're going. Wei thinks that Han's special ability won't materialize yet, so he'll need to learn to fight without it. And one way to do that is to train telekinesis to its highest level. Han witnessed the advanced move and is in awe of Wei's ability. Wei uses the poles as steps, telling Han that his abilities are like his muscles. The more they are used, the stronger they'll become. And Han has unlimited potential. He needs to train hard to surpass his elders. Han gets more motivated and we shift to the next day. Han enters the class, but an older kid immediately bumps into him. This kid is named Dimitri, and he immediately knows who Han is. He's famous around the school. Nice to meet you. Welcome to the class. Dimitri tells Han to follow him. They're going to weapons training. Han arrives and thinks to himself that Ark has been a hellish experience, constant pressure, and never knowing when you might be kicked out for not being good enough. But weapons training is the one place where Han can release all of the stress. Han grabs a spear and begins his training. He starts smacking all of the kids around, and it seems Kuro was being bullied again. And Han tells the kids that he just whooped, that Kuro's specialty is his psychic power. Is it fun to bully one person? Be glad there's no psychic sparring. Dimitri watches and starts feeling excitement. He can't wait to fight Han for real. The next chapter begins with Kuro's perspective of Han saving his ass. He's so happy that his friend is here to save him. Han calls out to Dimitri, is this what you call sparring? Dimitri's face turns evil as he says this is Ark's way. They don't pity the weak. They're actually helping Kuro by driving him into a corner. Han clenches his fist and can't think of words to say. Dimitri does agree that three against one is pretty boring. So how about we spar, Han? The boy doesn't get a chance to answer as Dimitri leaps in with the overhead slash. Han blocks, but Dimitri lets off another strike. Han has a plan to let Dimitri swing and exploit his poor balance, as we see Han striking the back of Dimitri's knees. Han thinks that he has him and tries to hit Dimitri in the face, but the boy manages to barely dodge the attack and uses his momentum to headbutt Han, sending him flying back. Han gets up. Headbutting? You said this was a weapon spar. Dimitri says that he's been training Sambo since he was born, and Han stands no chance in close quarter fights. Han gets up asking if Dimitri plans to wrestle dragons, and now a crowd is building. The older boys are cheering for Dimitri, telling him to drop that little baby. He begins to get cocky as Class B strokes his ego, and Han watches on, cursing these bastards. Dimitri is well respected as their leader. Han looks towards Kuro, but Dimitri dashes in. Han parries the first strike, and as Dimitri swings again, Han uses his spear as a pole vault to leap above him. 
He spins, increasing the force of his attack. But as he swings down on Dimitri, both of the boy's weapons break. Han realized that this was Dimitri's plan all along. And before he can regain himself, Dimitri rushes in ready to utilize his grappling. Han gets grabbed and suplexed into the ground. He puts Han in an arm bar, asking him to surrender. Han doesn't bend, telling Dimitri to do his worst. The older boys ask if Han has the guts to say that and breaks his arm. Han is now on the floor, reeling in pain. Dimitri tried to warn him. Kuro watches on, worried about his friend. Dimitri starts to leave, but gives Han some props. He didn't even scream as his arm was being broken. Dimitri tells one of his lackeys to take Han to the infirmary, but Han stands up with his broken spear and whacks Dimitri in the head, asking who the hell this kid thinks he is. All of his other sparring partners must have been soft. Let's finish this. But as he's calling him out, he sees Dimitri laying on the floor, unconscious. Dimitri wakes up, asking where the hell he is, but sees Han right next to him, looking at his bracelet, seeing the Major give him an update on the orphans. He'll send a video next time. Bye now. Han is so happy that his friends are being taken care of. He looks over and asks Dimitri to swipe to the next picture. Dimitri is a little confused, but starts swiping through all of the pictures, and Han tells him that that's pretty rude. You did break my arm, you know. But Dimitri gets mad. Han also knocked him out while he wasn't looking. But Han reiterates what Dimitri said. This is Ark's way. Dimitri can't really argue with that, and Han tells the boy that he has no hard feelings. And Dimitri says the same. Han thinks back and maybe he should offer to help Kuro, not fight for him. Dimitri understands how Han feels, but coldly tells him that Kuro could die the moment he gets to the second year. Han is shocked, but Dimitri quickly takes him somewhere. They arrive at the emergency room and see a man being carted off in a critical condition. Han sees the man and Dimitri asks if Han understands the intensity of the training that is done here. Han questions the man's age. He looked like an adult. Isn't he supposed to be our age? Dimitri understands Han's point, but informs him that once you get to the second year, you start the drug injections. It increases the speed in which the body matures. Han is completely shocked, but Dimitri asks why he's so surprised. They are supposed to fight dragons after all in only three years. Ark doesn't have the time to wait for them to grow up. Han thinks that this news isn't too bad, and he always wanted to grow up as fast as possible. He always had to do whatever to survive, and was always competing with adults. He doesn't need a happy childhood. He needs to survive. Dimitri is impressed at Han's attitude, and Han understands what Dimitri wanted to show him. We shift to the next day and Class B is taken for parachute training. Takeoff is at 4.30. Finish all of your final checks. Dimitri suits up, asking Han if he misses his hospital bed. Han looks back and smiles. He opens his bag and notices a lot of food inside. Han doesn't think this will be a simple exercise, but catching Dimitri's eye is Simon over to the left, also participating in this drill. Dimitri looks over and smiles, wanting to fight Simon as well. Simon looks back and sees Han next to this creepy ass guy. Han looks over to his right and sees Kuro, and he's already worried about his boy. But it's time to go. John orders the kids to get into the chopper. And they get in, and John watches. This is the end of cleaning up after those brats. We skip a little ahead and already see Kuro calling out to Han. And even before they started, he always knew that Han was here to save him, always within sight. But right now, Kuro cannot feel Han's presence, and no one is here to save him, as you see him tangled from a tree. We flash back to an hour ago as the kids ponder on where they're going. The bracelets go off, telling the kids that this starts their survival training. Each of the kids has two days worth of food in their bags. The rest is up to them. Everyone is shocked, but Dimitri looks happy at the challenge. John tells the kids that the instructors will return in one week. Survive until then. Obviously, the instructors didn't leave, but want the kids to think that, as John scoops a kid out of the water. There aren't any more stragglers, and everyone else is on the island. They tried to separate the kids' landing points, but some groups stuck together. John tells his men not to look down on those kids. They're the same as adults. And once survival mode kicks in, they will all prioritize strength. And instead of trying to survive together, they will take others' rations. As we see a fat kid doing this exact thing, telling his boys to leave some for their leader. As we see a blonde boy with a bandana coming forward, telling these kids that they are fools. They need to get as much as they can before sunset. Do you guys think I brought you here to share this food? They need to get everyone's rations so they can dominate the survival game. Everyone gets excited and they even think that they can take on Dimitri, Han, and Simon. But a sound is heard in the forest and the group goes to check it out. That's their next target. We shift to Han, wash up on the beach, annoyed at the time he wasted swimming. He looks around and knows that he needs to set up a camp ASAP. Han knows that the real challenge of this test, the rations, will become valuable and many cadets will try to steal them from each other. We now shift to Simon, seemingly being followed by Dimitri. And of course, all this bonehead can think about is fighting Simon. Simon, however, just turns around saying that he doesn't have time to waste on a stupid fight and leaves. Dimitri gets desperate and says that he said that not out of hostility. He just wants to spar. 
He sighs and thinks that he was a little too forward. They need to get to know each other first. The sun begins to set and the group of bullies are still looking for the sound that they heard. But shortly after, they stumble upon Kuro wrapped up in the tree. They steal his bag, but Kuro begs for them to at least let him down. But the group doesn't seem interested. They tell Kuro that he's not going to die in a week and he should be okay. And they begin laughing at the poor boy, causing him to cry. And he remains stuck in this tree for hours. And in this time, he reflected on his life. No matter what he does, he's always being bullied. What did he ever do wrong? All people ever did in his life was make fun of him for crying. And he begins bawling out again, but tires himself out calling out to Han as he falls asleep. Some rustling is heard in the bushes and Han shows up, surprised at seeing Kuro stuck in the tree like this. Han makes a tent and places Kuro inside to rest, and the next morning the boy jolts awake and exits to see Han working on some tools. The two enter the tent and Han shares his rations with Kuro. He knows his bag was stolen so he offers to share. Kuro knows that he's being a burden and thinks to himself that he's so pathetic. But thanks Han. Han knows that they need to look for some more water. Drones are up in the air acting as John's surveillance on the kids. Octo approaches his room and tells the man that smoking is banned. But John is obviously a chad and doesn't care. And asks why Octo is here. The engineer is just bored and wants to know if anything interesting is going on. John shows him something cool and we see a new character with orange hair, Meyer, who already made a raft and returned to Ark. We shift back to Khan and they found some drinkable water. The heat is intense during the day, so Han thinks to take Kuro back and wait it out. If they're going to survive, they're going to need to find some food. But all of a sudden, Kuro's eyes light up as he tells Han to watch out. He pulls him back and one more step, Han would have fell victim to a pitfall trap. Han is amazed that Kuro was able to see that and thinks that this must be one of his special abilities, short-term foresight, a rare talent. Maybe being in this stressed environment let him develop this skill. This might be a good opportunity for Kuro to improve his talents. The bully group spots Han's camp, but open the tent to see nobody in it. The leader tells his boys not to touch anything, they'll come back later. Han and Kuro are walking back and Kuro is visibly exhausted. Han however gets a realization, someone has been in their camp. The rocky place at the entrance of the tent has shifted in its location, and there are many sets of footprints around the tent. They're traveling as a pack. Han tells Kuro they need to pack up the tent and move locations. The sun is setting as the two look for a new suitable spot. Han asks Kuro if he can see anything and the boy is about to pass out. But he gets another psychic sensation, an image of a panther. He jumps to push Han out of the way, which makes him dodge the panther's attack. The panther circles around Han, and his spear is on the other side of the beast. It roars, but someone is flaring an ability, and shoots a beam at the panther, causing it to run away in pain. The boy asks if Han is okay, and now we see Jose is back. Jose lets go of his powers and greets the two. Han notices Jose's injured leg, and the boy tries to play it cool. But he ran into a trap that some of the other cadets set, and the boy immediately falls down struggling to put weight on his injured leg. Han says that they also spotted a trap, and Jose thinks that the group that's looting must be behind it. Jose's not worried since he didn't have anything for the boys to steal. Once he got injured, he ate everything that he had. Han just sighs in disappointment, and now the group of three goes to find some place to rest. The leader of the bullies looks up at the sky and we get some backstory on him, as we see his father inform him that he has psychic abilities. We find out his name. Carl, and the father thinks that it's finally his chance, and he wants Carl to enlist in Ark. The father grips his son intensely. If his son becomes a psyker, they'll have more fame and fortune than ever, more than he would have ever had making and acting. And when this war is over, psychers will be the military backbone of the nation and dominate the population. It doesn't seem like Carl wanted to attend this academy, but he was forced into it. And back on the island, we see Simon being annoyed by Dimitri again, who's training doing one-handed push-ups. Simon asks if the boy is tired and they're running out of food. And how the hell is he going to survive the next couple of days? Dimitri the bonehead doesn't care. He only cares about his muscles. He wants to be a great striker. Simon doesn't agree since he thinks they only need their psychic abilities, which pisses off Dimitri. He sighs and says that he misses Han. He was the only one able to put up a good spar. Simon begins to get angry seeing how Dimitri fought his rival. And the bait worked as Dimitri smiles, thanking Han in his mind for giving him the opportunity to fight Simon. We shift back to Han and the boys and they set up a fire in a small cave. Han says himself and Kuro will go collect firewood and Jose will defend the base. And thanks to his ignition ability, they'll be able to keep warm and having fire means that they'll be able to cook fish as Han and Kuro look at a fresh pond. Kuro wonders how they plan to catch the fish without rods, but Han just interrupts thanking Kuro for finding the cave. Kuro is not used to getting compliments as his brain almost explodes. Han apologizes and says that he thought he was helping Kuro, 
but he won't be able to defend him forever, and he's going to need to be his own man in order to survive. But yesterday gave Han his answer. Kuro is a psychic prodigy, they can, and they can work together to survive. After all, they are friends. We get some backstory on Kuro, and he was an orphan with no name in Japan. His whole life he was mocked and ridiculed. But finally, for the first time, he has a friend that believes in him. Kuro's powers start to manifest and he dives his head into the pond. He can see where the fish are moving. Han watches on and is amazed. If Kuro can combine this ability with telekinesis, he'll be able to catch the fish without tools. And right on cue, Kuro catches one out of the water. They both walk back to the cave with bowls full of fish, and Han is amazed at his friend's skills. But something alerts Han as he rushes towards their hideout, telling Kuro to stay back. He rushes into the cave and sees Jose beaten on the ground. Dimitri throws Simon a sparring sword, and he's confused on why this kid brought sparring equipment to this training. Dimitri was torn between using double swords lately, which makes Simon sigh. Dimitri asks why Simon even agreed to spar, and Simon says that if Dimitri was able to fight Han, then he has to be Class B's leader, and knows that he's strong. Let's see if you deserve to be in class A. Dimitri's aura spikes and he starts to like these new kids. The two dash in with their swords but Simon stops right before engaging, causing Dimitri to miss. He stabs his sword into Dimitri's chest but the boy doesn't give up as Dimitri slashes Simon away. He rushes in and lets off a barrage of strikes, causing Simon to stagger. He dodges a vertical slash and uses his ability to move behind Dimitri. But the Serbian was able to dodge at the last second. He gets on his back and swats Simon's sword away. Simon disengages now but still has no weapon and Dimitri takes advantage. But Simon uses his telekinesis to hit Dimitri in the head with his distant sword. Simon brushes his hair back and says that Dimitri would have won if this was a weapon spar, but they are psychers after all, and thinks to himself that this must mean that Han is stronger than this guy. We shift back to Han holding Jose, calling out to him. Jose wakes up and tells the two that he isn't dead, so stop yelling. Han questions who did this to him, and it was none other than Carl Hines. He is a group of seven men, and they took all of their food. Jose fears that they will be back again, but Han has had enough. He won't let these punks steal their food and beat up his friends. He escorts Jose out and looks for a new location. And when the sun goes down, the battle is on. That's when Han will attack. Nighttime comes and Han and Kuro are stalking out Carl's group. Han thinks that this will be impossible to attack alone, but the two of them can do it. Kuro doesn't want to let his friends down and starts channeling his powers. He uses telekinesis to lift and throw rocks, and it starts hitting Carl's goons. One of the men goes down and alerts the rest of the group out. Two goons rush in towards the bushes, but Kuro can predict their movements and pelts them with rocks. Han jumps into melee and starts whacking them down one by one. Carl comes out annoyed at what's going on, and Han holds his spear ready to face him. Carl is shocked that Han came out so soon. And did he take out all six of his men by himself? No, that's impossible. Carl knows that Han is not alone and asks Han who's with him. Han tells Kuro to come out, but he can handle this guy by himself. Carl's veins bulge at the fact that his squad was beaten by Han and a loser like Kuro. Han starts to get angry as well and he's here to avenge Jose. This won't be a spar, so Han won't go easy. Carl takes off his shirt, telling Han that he will crush him, and Han prepares his aura. Carl charges in, but is whacked in the head by Han's spear. Carl doesn't relent and continues his assault, but Han ducks under his slash and hits him again in the chest. Carl grits his teeth in pain, but Han mocks him. Brace yourself, Carl. This is only the start. Carl's anger builds as he tries to strike Han again, but is hit repeatedly until the boy falls onto the floor, with blood dripping from his mouth. Just how strong is Han? This is impossible. Han stands over Carl and tells him that this is for Jose. You didn't give him any sympathy when you beat him, did you? Carl still is fuming, cursing Han for looking down on him. We get some more backstory, as Carl was a renowned actor in Germany, but his father took advantage of his whole career in fame, and his greed had no end. Carl manages to get up, and he did not come here to be stopped by Han, and he throws sand into the boy's face and punches him brutally. Kuro tries to help, but Carl's menacing stare makes him freeze, as Carl unleashes several punches into Han's stomach. Han is out on the floor, as Carl picks up his spear to end this, but Kuro uses his power to stop Carl. Carl just walks up to the boy and grabs him by the collar. Why are you even here, loser? You're so useless. A piece of shit like you should have been kicked out already. But in his little rant, Han stands behind him and punches him into the floor, asking if Carl thinks that he is useful. He only hid behind his numbers, and all of Han's friends are way better than him. Han tells Carl that he has too many obstacles in front of him to climb, and he's nothing. Han raises his spear, but misses Carl's face on purpose, telling the boy that everyone has a reason to climb, but he just needs a different one, and warns the boy not to touch his friends again. He won't spare him twice. 
Carl just laughs on the floor, defeated. And after this training, he actually left Ark on his own free will. And Han, along with his friends, passed the exam on the remaining three days. The choppers come back, ready to escort the kids, as they look up relieved that it's finally over. A group of boys comes up to Han and his boys, thanking them for sharing their food. It's only because of them that they got through this. They also praise Kuro and Jose's skills. But Jose stops them and says nothing would have been possible without Han. So thank him. And like this, the survival training has ended. And for the first time, the kids are happy to hear John's voice. But they are called to board the helicopter when their name is called, and this confuses Han. Why only after they're called? We shift to John's chopper, and the entire exercise was being monitored by the staff, and only four kids were chosen. Dimitri, Han, Kuro, and Simon. This wasn't a regular training. This was to find prodigies that would give Ark the best soldiers to fight their enemy, and these four cadets are ready for the level 2 advancement. We shift back to Ark and Han has a day off. Jose comes up to him asking him if he's ever played soccer, and Han says that he has. We shift to the field where a bunch of the boys are gathered, and Jose, Han, and Kuro are on one side, with Dimitri and Simon on the other. At Ark, holidays are only ever had when there's something of great importance. And the reason today was a day off was because all of the instructors had a meeting, an advanced evaluation for level 2. The chief of staff, Recor, starts the conversation, and Sasha Grace chimes in, saying that this time there's only four worthy cadets. What are they like? Recor says Dimitri and Simon are the most capable in every field. Han, however, has the lowest psychic ability. And if it wasn't for John, he wouldn't have been advanced. Why should they let him proceed? State your reasons. And Strongter Way begins going back to Han's spar with John, and how he showed no fear and even injured John. Han is outstanding with weapons, and his fighting ability is impeccable, and he's a perfect soldier. Rikor is impressed that Wei is giving some high praise, and John chimes in that Han also weaves in his psychic powers into his weapons, and this increases the strength of his strikes. And the most incredible part is that he came up with these methods without being taught. We shift back to the game and it's getting heated and Han even scores a golasso out of nowhere, which impresses Jose. Dimitri starts getting annoyed, saying that Simon is supposed to be good. Isn't he from England? Don't they play soccer over there? But Simon just tells the boy to shut up. We shift back to the meeting and we get some chilling news as Sasha slams her hand on the desk with a picture of Kuro. He's psychic sensitive. If he advances to the next level, he might die. John sighs and says that Kuro's psychic ability is the greatest out of the four, and he already has short-term foresight, which will be vital in the upcoming operations. His only issue is his weak mentality. But this is another reason why Han needs to advance. Kuro is influenced deeply by Han, and given time, Han will sculpt him into a stronger man. Rikor sighs, and it seems the two instructors are eager to promote Han, huh? We shift back to the soccer game, and Jose is crossing everybody up, and he passes the ball to Han for another goal. The two shake hands, but an instructor comes to ruin the fun. John tells them that he confirmed that all four of the candidates are confirmed for advancement. Han clenches his fist, but Jose puts a hand on his shoulder, congratulating him for this achievement. Make sure to save a spot for me, huh? As he has a wide smile. This calms Han down, and he shakes Jose's hand, telling him that they're going to meet again. John tells everyone to return to their dorms, and for those that are advancing, they should gather their equipment. Han turns to thank John for helping him advance, but John doesn't think he should be too excited. Now, he can't quit, and if he manages to survive level 2, they're going to meet again. Survive, Han Lee. Han gives John a salute, and this ends their journey for now. We see the four boys with their things walking together and Dimitri is pumped, but Kuro is visibly nervous. They're going to have an operation to become adults. Han tells them that it's going to be okay, but Dimitri is just excited to get stronger. They arrive and Sasha is the one to greet them. She will take care of them for the next five weeks. Han is surprised by the timeline. Their bodies will take five weeks to become adults? The first two are spent in incubation, and the last three, the last three is rehab training. The group is nervous to be stuck in a tube for two weeks straight, but Han breaks the silence telling his friends that he's going to see them in 14 days. They all join hands and Sasha is further interested in the boy that John recommended. The boys are strapped up and Sasha orders for the operation to begin, as her tanks fill with green fluid. Dimitri and Han immediately feel the effects and it's suffocating. Sasha knows that every child feels claustrophobia, and especially in this stage. But soon, they're going to fall asleep as the anesthesia is administered, and the boys are put to sleep. A week passes and nothing went wrong yet, but today's procedure will be a turning point in their lives. This is how far humans must go to survive. One of the nurses tells Sasha to take a break. She looks tired. She exits the, she exits the room and spots John just chilling on the couch. Sasha points out that John always said that he had no interest in children, yet here he is every day checking on his cadets. He just says that he's here to make sure that the doctor doesn't damage his assets or kill them. Sasha gets annoyed and says everything is fine for now. They are now administering the second culture fluid. This substance has dragon's psychic core, 
a highly concentrated fluid that contains a dragon's heart. And the boys are forced to resonate with the core, and in turn, they will have a better connection with their powers. John takes a hit of his cigar and thinks that maybe Han will have a better time using his abilities. But interrupting the two, Sasha's bracelet goes off, and she sprints back into the lab to see something is wrong with Han. He's regained consciousness, and if he's awake, he's going to start feeling an intense amount of pain. Sasha goes to stop the procedure, but John stops her. Han has to advance no matter what. You can't stop this now, Doctor. Sasha is conflicted on what to do, but we time skip to see a grown up Chad Han talking to Sasha. And this whole and this situation has never happened to them before. This is the first time a psyker displayed resistance to psychic abilities. We shift back to the present as Han is banging on the glass and Sasha begins tearing up. She has to stop this. Han might die. But John holds her down. Han didn't come this far to quit. Continue the treatment. Without the psychic resonance, if it's that bastard Han, he's gonna be fine. We shift back to grown up Han talking with Sasha as she tells him that he only developed physically, which is a rare case, and asks if he feels okay. Han actually feels great, doesn't have anything to worry about. At least he knows he won't be kicked out if his abilities aren't up to par. Sasha brushes her hair back, amazed at his mental fortitude. No wonder John is so connected to him. The two are alike. But psychic powers are directly related to one's mental strength. But in Han's case, his power is so weak, even though his mentality is so strong. It must have something to do with the resistance to psychic abilities. Han leaves and sees Dimitri. Long time no see, huh? Simon is right behind him and the three catch up. Five weeks passed in a flash. Everyone changed so much, especially Kuro. And he doesn't look like such a pussy now. Damn, Han says. He's so happy that everyone survived. But Simon has an attitude. Who made Han the leader anyways? Han is confused on what he did, but now Kuro and Han go to the level 2 building. There's no real difference from the level 1, but now each cadet will train within a squad that has up to 10 members. There are 12 squads in the second level. Han and Kuro enter the room as the leader of squad 7 introduces himself as Kato. He knows all about the two and tells them there are several types of training in level 2. Firearms, airborne, and mock battles. Han knows that firearms training is important because it's still effective on the minions of the dragons. We are introduced to the minions that humans have knowledge of. There are low intellect ones like ogres, grunts, and wolves, but also there are high intellect minions called Elao who serve as commanders. And apparently those bastards have psychic abilities and can ward off physical weapons. The good news is they aren't like dragons who have unlimited energy, so they die pretty quickly once they run out. All of these training methods are competitions between other squads, and mock battles are held in an artificial forest in a training arena. The main event is capture the flag. It requires excellent teamwork and focus, but can be extremely dangerous. The weapons aren't bladed, but they're still made of steel, so injuries are frequent. The airborne training is also like a spar with the goal to knock your opponent off of their drone. And there's always a supporter in the back manipulating the drones to help their squad survive. Up until now, no one in squad 7 was good enough to be a supporter, but with Kuro here, that might change. Kuro doesn't answer confidently, and a big blonde guy starts barking at Kuro. This isn't a question, boy. You gotta fulfill your role. Han chimes in saying if this is psychic related, then he's sure Kuro will do it. But he's not the type to perform well if you pressure him. The blonde Hulk gets into Han's face, telling him to shut the fuck up, but Han stands unfazed. Kato tells the man to chill. It's their first day after all, but he warns Han to show some respect. Everyone here is his senior after all. Kato's face turns sinister, and to be honest Han, the only reason why you are here is because they wanted Kuro, and you two are a package deal. None of the squad members expect much out of Han who still has a low psychic rank, and the whole squad begins laughing. Han clenches his fist in anger but says he understands. He won't get in their way, squad leader. The two men shake hands but despise each other inside of their minds. Han goes to take a shower and we shift to the shooting range, and Han is excelling in all of the exercises, impressed with his own skill. Kato looks towards Kuro, asking what the hell he's doing. He shakes his head and scolds the boy. We shift back to Han's shower, wondering if Kuro is still too mentally weak. Kato meets with Han, telling him that he's on standby for the next mock battles. And since their squad has more members than others, they need to sit some people in order to make it fair. But everyone is able to spectate, so have fun watching. All of the squads group up in the gym watching the battle, and Kato mentions a new star in group 3. Han knows that this must be Simon, and that bastard is a psychic genius. The blue team holds up their weapons, shocked that squad 3 is so aggressive. But the reason they're like this is because they're so confident in their new recruit. They're gonna wipe them out with ease. Simon flares his aura, and the blue team charges in. But all of their weapons are taken, and Simon uses his telekinesis to slam them down on the soldiers. The rest of his squad goes in to finish the job and squad 3 wins easily. Kato thinks Kuro will be able to do something similar, and Han comes up with an idea, but as he starts to explain, Kato gets angry, pausing him. Do you think you're the leader? Han now knows why he's so hated, and holds his thought. Another boy calls out to him, and the two step out. 
He says that all the members agree that Han is an amazing fighter, but he just doesn't fit into Squad 7. Han is happy that they at least acknowledge him, but asks why he doesn't fit. The reason is, is because he isn't scared of talking to Kato during training, and this causes a power imbalance. There can only be one head in the squad, and Han being here will cause a divide. As long as Kato is the leader, Han won't be able to join any mock battle. Han closes his eyes and understands. He threatens the hierarchy. Han takes a transfer request to Wei, and Wei is shocked, but says he'll work on it. But all the instructors have to agree. Han doesn't mind and needs some time anyways. Since he doesn't have to worry about mock battles, he can train in his own ways. And while he's waiting, he can observe the battles and come up with strategies. Kuro steps into the room asking why Han spoke with the instructor. But Han just tells him it wasn't anything crazy, just about tomorrow's airborne battle. Kuro can now operate four air bits with people on them, and Han is impressed. Kuro is improving quickly, and he's climbing the ranks. Han tells his friend that he's always going to cheer for him. We shift back to the gym, and Han is watching. Everyone is now talking about Kuro as we start the airborne training. Kato tells Kuro to take good care of them. It's squad 1 versus squad 7. Han watches on and we get some info on this game. The battle takes place on an airbit, and most dragons can fly, so it's only natural to fight them in the air. And these airbits can be maneuvered using psychic power. In an airborne battle, one person usually uses two airbits, one to travel with and one to use as a weapon. And most teams have a supporter. Their role is to manipulate the airbits at the same time, to minimize their psychic usage for their teammates. And this training is perfect for Kuro, since he can control four of them at once. Kato starts the battle and tells his boys to get started, and three of them fly out. Squad 1 charges in with 5 members and they are attacking all together, just as Kato expected. Squad 1 has a plan and 2 members dash to the sides, but to their surprise, 2 members of Squad 7 were waiting for them to pop up, and they quickly deal with these 2 members, seemingly like they already knew their plan. Everyone in the gym is amazed, and we flash back to Kato stating their plan. Squad 1 doesn't have a good support, so each member will fly with their own airbit, and since Kuro can control all of theirs at once, he'll only focus on the vice leader and Kato's airbit, and using his foresight ability, he will send them to intercept the next move of the opponent. The plan is foolproof, as Squad 7 is wiping the floor with Squad 1, but Kuro starts to get nervous, thinking that if he makes a single mistake, everyone will lose. The battle starts getting heated as strikes are being sent back and forth. The remnants of Squad 1 have to take out the support, but a guy tells his boys that they are going to go with Plan A. One soldier dashes in, and another one uses him as bait to leap over the soldiers and jump on to the airbit, targeting Kuro. He gets past their lines, and Squad 7 is now in danger. Han is shocked. They should have protected Kuro, and now he's vulnerable. But as a part of Kato's plan, airbits 4 and 8 are on standby next to Kuro, and he's allowed to use them as weapons at the man flying at him. Kato finishes off the man holding him down, but turns around to see Kuro on the floor, and since he's unconscious, everyone's airbit deactivated. And now, the match is over. Kato's strategy was to solely depend on Kuro, but right as Kuro was about to attack the bandana guy, he missed under his own pressure, and this cost him the match, and squad 1 is the victor. If Han was the squad leader, he would have never left Kuro by himself. We see Han meeting with Wei again, and he reviewed the documents that Han submitted, and it was approved. The squad establishment request. Han is amazed that it was actually passed through, and the only reason it was is because Han's leadership is amazing, so they're going to give him a chance. But now he has the conditions for creating a new squad. All he needs is four members, one from any existing squad, but they have the option to reject. If Han goes through with this, all the squad leaders will hate him, but he doesn't have time to care about this. He clenches his fist, ready to alter his path. Han thinks of who he wants to join his team, and we see a shot of Jose and Kuro. But unfortunately, Jose isn't here, so he's gonna have to start with Kuro. But there's one other person he can ask, Dimitri. Han rushes to his room and Dimitri greets him. Kato is disappointed because their winning rate keeps falling, just because of Kuro. The blonde man tells Kato that they should have got Simon instead, and he's pretty awesome. Not only is he an excellent, not only is he an excellent fighter, but his abilities are outstanding, and he isn't scared to take on multiple people at once. Han is listening in on the conversation, and Kato knows Kuro can't do anything alone, but they don't have anyone to replace him. We shift back to Han's conversation with Dimitri, and Dimitri asks who else wants to join, but only Kuro comes to mind. Dimitri thinks finding more members will be a problem, and no leader will want to give up a member for free. Han gets to the point and asks Dimitri for his answer, but the man just scratches his head and refuses to join. He's next up to be the squad leader in Squad 5, and he can't leave them now. Han understands and Dimitri doesn't want to be below Han and would much rather be his enemy, for now at least. Han smiles and pats the man on the chest. 
Don't be scared when we meet on the battlefield. Han is walking the halls and everyone is talking about him. He ignores their comments and all of the squad leaders are making their move, especially Kato. The two men meet and Kato is furious that Han was planning to betray him this whole time and refuses to give Kuro away. Han tells Kato that Kuro won't be able to show his abilities under him. Kato says that Kuro will develop them with time and he's still valuable. But Han gets mad. They don't have time to wait. Han knows how to utilize Kuro's abilities and can help him now. They don't have time to waste. A war can break out. Han continues ranting, but Kato gets furious, grabbing him by the collar. Shut up, brat. I'll never give you Kuro. Han tells him that it's not his choice. It's Kuro's. And Kato looks towards the boy with a murderous face, telling him that if he leaves, Kato will kill him. Han tells the man that he's all talk and he won't be able to do shit. But Kato gets angry and punches Han in the face. Kato calms down and knows that there's punishment for hitting another squad leader. But Han gets up telling the man that he's gonna let this slide and tells Kuro that he's waiting for his answer. Some cadets think that Han is a fool who would follow an unproven leader. And if he fails to set up his own group, what kind of punishment will he get? Han walks the halls stressed on what he can do. He's got approval, but how can he get enough members? But interrupting his thoughts, a guy with a skull mask bumps into him, but then dashes past. Han is surprised by how fast this guy is, and he's wearing his uniform so weirdly. Is that even okay? All of a sudden, the squad leaders are called. Sasha tells them that six more people were promoted sophomores, and they're awaiting for squad deployment. And the priority is given to Han, since he's the newest squad. Han clenches his fist, and he needs to recruit at least one person here. Han stands up and tells all the new cadets that he's short on members, and he will accept anyone into his squad. Everyone laughs at him, but one man steps up saying that he will join. And it's none other than motherfucking Jose. The two now sit in their new room and they still need two more members. This is gonna be tough. Han knows why people don't want to join. They don't know if Han is a capable leader. But he thanks Jose for joining. He's always wanted to team up with him. Jose smiles and tells Han that all those bastards are stupid for not realizing this opportunity. Jose stretches and says tomorrow they gotta start recruiting some more people. But interrupting them, a knock is heard on the door, and Kuro comes in with his face beaten. Kuro left the 7th squadron, despite Kato's warning, and this was the result. Han smiles, telling Kuro that he's awesome, and Jose says this is the reunion of the little squad, and they won't lose to anyone. Another boy steps into the room, saying that this looks interesting. Everyone talks about Han like he's some sort of rebel. Do you mind if I join too? The 13th squad looks like the most fun. Jose says that he knows this guy from class B. It's Knut Meyer. And why does he do finger guns as soon as he's introduced? This just ruins his whole character, but hopefully he does something badass. Knut thanks Han for accepting him and looks forward to working with him. Han smiles and tells the three boys that the road ahead won't be easy, and everyone will target them. And if they don't handle it correctly, they might be disbanded. Are you guys sure you want to go forward with this? Everyone doesn't have a second thought and Han smiles. He has some weight on his shoulders now, but he's sure that he can do it, and tells his squad that they're gonna gather tomorrow. A new man is introduced to Squad 13, Grossman, the chief instructor for second years. The man asks Kuro what happened to his face, but the boy lies saying that he fell down the stairs. Grossman informs Squad 13 that they're going to have a three week grace period before mandatory participation in the mock battles. Han smiles in determination. Grossman was warning them not to take this time off lightly. We are now skipping to a gun survival competition between Squad 7 and Squad 9. Squad 9 has the highest score in this activity. Knut takes off his helmet complaining how hot it is, but Han slams it back on his head. Are you trying to get yourself killed? Don't ever take your helmet off, no matter what. You got that? Han doesn't want to let anyone in his squad die. He puts his own helmet on and explains the plan, moving bunker. This gun survival game begins with squad 9, with squad 9 starting the advance. Han tells his boys it's time to go. The activity begins and everyone in the gym is watching. Dimitri and Simon also see the commotion interested in Han's team. Squad 9 holds a tree line but has no sight on Han's men. They go to push in but Knut has eyes on them, but fears that they are pushing up too soon. Han also starts to stress due to the now increased pressure, but they manage to prepare their trap. They just need to catch a break. Han knows Knut is planning to join them as you see the boy running, but he gets shot in the leg, causing him some intense pain. He turns around in a last ditch effort to take at least one down with him, but he fires and completely misses the target, and manages to find some cover behind the tree. He knows the plan, but getting to his boys with this injured leg will prove difficult. Squad 9 halts their assault, questioning why there's only one of them here. Is a lookout necessary in a 4 on 4? Something has to be wrong here. The leader offers to go and asks his boys to cover, and we shift to Han telling Kuro and Jose that it's time to move. Knut has bought them enough time, and by now he's probably injured. But thanks to that, the other three have recovered their strength. They spent a lot of time cutting and bringing trees, so they needed to recover their psychic energy. But now it's time to show what Squad 13 is made of, as they move out with a movable cover. Dimitri and Kuro are both impressed, but look at each other 
awkwardly. Knut is still holding his position, but as he tries to reload, Squad 9's leader approaches, wondering what the hell is going on. He thought this was a trap, but whatever. Dimitri and Simon watch on, waiting to see what Han is planning, but all of a sudden, Han's movable cover starts pushing Squad 9, and they can't stop it. Squad 9's men are only good with firearms, and their psychic ability is lacking, and Han is exploiting this weakness. As he's pushing them back, the men try to stall for time so Kuro can get tired, but this tree shield isn't only for cover, as Jose fires up his flare powers, and he starts lighting up smoke, causing Squad 9 to be flushed from their cover. Han is happy with how this is progressing as Squad 9 starts to cough uncontrollably. They try to catch their breaths, but both men are taken out in two quick shots, thanks to Kuro's foresight ability. Han continues his assault and Squad 13 wins. Everyone in the gym is going crazy. How the hell did they manage to win? Kuro's powers are crazy, and that Han kid is no joke. Dimitri is pumped up for his rival, but Simon looks nervous. In the back, Grossman watches on, interested in Han. Squad 13 is now in their rooms, celebrating their victory. Knut is happy it worked out, cause being shot hurts like hell. The squad is enjoying a feast and Jose starts off a toast to their squad leader. Han gets awkward but thanks his teammates. His plan was a long shot, but they executed it perfectly. Kuro pumps his fist and he always knew that it would work. And Han is happy that they matched up with squad 9, because he had the most information on them. Knut tries to say something nice, but holds his stomach in pain. But even if he was shot, he would never miss a meal. The group laughs on and we shift to a shot of Grossman in front of his computer, starting to sweat. He picked Squad 9 to decimate Squad 13. To think they would win is unbelievable. He needs to take care of them before they become a bigger problem. He finds a picture of Kato, thinking Squad 7 is the perfect ones for this job. They will do whatever it takes to take them down. All he has to do is make sure that they can't lose. Han wakes up unable to sleep, and he was so worried about being expelled. But he has people that count on him now, so he can't fail, and they will win no matter what they are up against. The next day comes and now it's squad 1 versus squad 13, and it's the same bandana guy leading his men. Now they know to avoid Kuro and Jose's powers. Bandana pats one of his men and says that he's with him. Their psychic abilities may be strong, but let's make sure they can't stay focused. They don't know how the other two will fight, but no matter. Squad 1 will make their captain the strongest guy in arc, and Mr. Bandana hands the captain's man to the big guy in their party. Dimitri is watching again, thinking Grossman must be pissed off to send the top two squads back to back to fight Squad 13. In this competition, the squad can only win once they take down the enemy team's captain. Squad 1's captain is hard to take down even with two or three men. The rest of their group will support the captain. Squad 1's specialty is to charge, and Dimitri can't wait to see how Han counters this one. But as soon as Squad 1 sees Squad 13, Mr. Bandana is taken aback. Why is Kuro the captain? As you see him nervous behind Jose and Knut. Squad 1 starts to get confused, but Jose and Knut tell Kuro not to worry. They're gonna protect him. Bandana tells his guys to stick with the plan, and they charge in. But as they do so, Han is watching from above the tree line. There's no need to take all of them out. All they need to do is take out the captain. The two squads charge in, and Jose fires up his ability, and ducks underneath the slash. Knut is holding his own as well, and Han watches on, and signals Kuro to get ready. No need to worry guys, we got this. Han jumps off the tree and is being manipulated by Kuro's power. Jose and Knut are grabbed by Squad 1's captain, but as Mr. Bandana gets cocky, Han comes flying in. But before Mr. Bandana can catch on to what is happening, Han swoops in to Squad 1's captain, completely decimating him, knocking him out. And with that, Squad 13 is the victor yet again, as Han holds up their captain's headband. Everyone in the gym is speechless. Did Han really jump off that tree? It was like 5 stories high. Wow, he's so awesome. The gyms light up in awe of Han and his squad, and Dimitri smiles. He knew Han was smart, but his strategies are insane. The prey starts to build and build, but one man is beginning to get angry, and none other than Kato, the man who's known for not realizing Han's talents. We flash back to one day before the match where Han and Kuro were practicing this dive tactic. They finish up and Han is impressed with Kuro's power. Han says that controlling humans with telekinesis is hard, and if it wasn't, then everyone would just be able to fly. All Kuro needs to do is control Han's speed, so as he falls, no one gets seriously hurt. We shift back to the present and Kuro apologizes to Han. It's his fault that his arm was broken in the fall. Han tells him to relax, it's all good. Kuro made sure that they got the win, and they took down that beast of a man in one hit. Jose comments that they shouldn't have any matches until Han's arm fully heals, but interrupting their thoughts is a match scheduled. Squad 7 vs Squad 13. Footsteps are heard as Kato runs into Grossman's room, with sweat beating down his face. Squad 13 is now confused. How can they get another match so soon, even when Han is injured? They must be trying to punish them. Jose wants to talk to the instructors, and we shift back to Grossman and Kato's talk. Grossman smiles. You're designed to win, Kato. Are you still scared? Kato's veins bulge. He wants to beat the life out of Han, and Grossman tells the cadet 
to prove it. We shift back to squad 13 and Han tells his boys there's no use complaining. All they need to do is win. He's gonna figure something out, don't worry. Kato approaches Han asking if he's gonna be alright with only one arm. But Han says that having only his left arm is more than enough to take care of Kato. Don't worry man. But Han says that his left arm is more than enough to take care of him. Don't worry. Kato gets to Han's face, telling him air combat isn't something you can get overnight. You're smart enough to know that, right? Han tells the man that he'll wipe the floor with him, and Kato swears to kill Han. But Han looks at the man coldly. If you never killed somebody before, don't make a threat like that. And with that cold ass statement, Kato runs off. Han is in a pinch and knows what Kato is saying is true. They need to practice. Han is trying to use his psychic ability, but is struggling to lift the air bit, and they might be screwed even if Han was healthy. He can only control two air bits, but right now, he can barely lift one. He can't rely on Jose since he needs to use his ignition ability. They would have to have Kuro control all four, but Han doesn't want to put pressure on him like that. And even without a strong supporter, Squad 7 has strong fighters with good psychic abilities. And the teamwork they built under Kato isn't something to laugh at. If they fight them head on, they will have no chance of winning. Jose uses his skill, but in midair, it's not too effective. There isn't much to set on fire, and considering how fast people are moving, he won't be able to hit them. Kato's squad watches the boys from the rafters, confident in their abilities. Han thinks that winning is looking impossible. We shift to the match day, and all of the men in the gym are talking. Why is Han's squad fighting again? Isn't he injured? And they don't have air combat experience. Dimitri thinks that this is some sort of punishment, and Simon looks pretty worried. He turns around to see Dimitri and asks what the hell he's doing. Don't stand behind me like some creep. Simon thinks that Grossman is trying to make sure that all of the squads have a less than 50% win rate, and uses this to manipulate the training data. But for Han to win this, he's gonna need something special. Squad 7 and 13 face each other, and Kato tells his boys that it's time to show these traitors what their punishment is. Han smiles confidently and asks if Jose is feeling good. The plan is all about his secret weapon. The fight begins, but Kato's mouth immediately drops, as Squad 13 is controlling 16 air bits. No way. How the hell are they doing this? Even if Kuro can control 4, how can the rest of them control 2 each? This doesn't make any sense. Han laughs. So Kato, looks like you got a lot on your mind. Let me help you take a load off. Kato tries to keep his squad's morale high and tells him that we're going to take them down one by one. Han has been practicing his telekinesis non-stop. It's still far from average, but if he concentrates only on this, he can throw the air bits much faster combining his strength with it, as he hurls an air bit at squad 7. Kato is shocked at Han's plan. It's fast, but are you planning to use all of them like that? As long as they dodge them, they should be okay. But we get a flashback to Jose saying that his power isn't that useful. But Han has a plan to make sure that it is. And as his airbit is flying at Squad 7, Jose starts using his ignition, causing the airbit to explode in the center of Squad 7. Dimitri and Simon are completely shocked, along with everyone in the gym. Did they just blow up an airbit? Those things are expensive. Who cares? Squad 13 is the best. Han continues this combination attack as two men from Squad 7 fall from the airbits. Kato struggles to find a countermeasure and Grossman comes rushing out, trying to stop Han. We shift to after this battle and Grossman calls for Han to come to his office. Han has been there for 10 minutes, but not a word was said. Grossman scratches his head and asks Han if he knows how much those air bits cost. Han doesn't and says he has no money, but Grossman says that Han is lucky he's at Ark. He couldn't afford one in his entire lifetime. Grossman sighs and technically Han didn't break any rules, but his methods are stirring up some trouble. Some instructors might give him credit for doing something like this, but Grossman is not one of them. Run these plans by me before you blow up Ark property, please. Han wants to ask Grossman a question. If he was fighting a dragon, would you be so caught up about expenses? They have to win, no matter what. Grossman is startled and sees a splitting image of John Red coming from Han, and stands up laughing. He likes Han's attitude, and looks forward to Han's future battles. We shift to Kato, who's reminiscing about his loss. He put up a fight to the very last second, and Han even jumped off his air bit to make sure that he got Kato. Kato scolds Han for using dirty tricks like that. People are gonna look down on him. Han asks if Kato came all the way here to tell him that. But the man just walks out telling Han not to lose to anyone until they fight again. We shift back to Squad 13's room as they celebrate yet another victory, and Han breaks the news that they are fine, even after blowing up some air bits. Jose is worried and Kuro asks what's wrong. He's suspicious about his bracelet. Whenever they start celebrating, it always goes off, and right on cue, a new match is scheduled. Squad 13 versus Squad 5. Capture the flag. And this news shocks everyone. We shift to Dimitri Chaining, pumped up at fighting his rival. Han just laughs. Typical Grossman, to put them against a squad specialized in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It looks like their lives won't get any easier. Dimitri is finishing up a run, but a long-haired man walks past him with a weird glance. 
This was Squad 5's previous leader. Dimitri puts his hand on his shoulder, kind of bragging that ever since he was put in as leader, they've been winning non-stop. But the man tells him to get lost before he kills Dimitri. Dimitri is shocked at first, but then gets excited. They're gonna have to duke it out. The next chapter starts with Han visibly exhausted fighting somebody else. He doesn't know how this man is so strong, as you see the masked cadet from before, wielding dual blades. He has a gleam in his mask and disappears, and when he reappears, he hits Han with a barrage of strikes, sending him to the ground in pain. We shift back to Han talking with Grossman, who informs him that Dimitri was seriously injured from the man that he provoked earlier, as we see Dimitri's head slammed into the ground. But the competition will still go on. Han thinks it should be easier since the leader is now gone, but Grossman hands Han some papers, an application for a squad transfer request. Some members from Kato's squad are getting annoyed that he doesn't recognize their talents. Han thinks that something like this was bound to happen, and these are all level 2s who have high hopes for competing right off the bat. Grossman tells Han to take his time, but Han immediately accepts all of the applicants, as we see new 4 members to squad 13, Domingo, Kasim, Andy, and Jigo. Han tells them that today they will start preparing for the competition tomorrow, and he will analyze their skills. One man has a question as Jigo tells Han to please take care of him as a fellow Korean. Han gets angry telling the man that nationality doesn't matter, show your skills. Jigo gets pissed thinking Han is a stiff and runs off. The other members are confused but we go towards the competition. Squad 5 versus Squad 13. Capture the flag. The dome closes causing a nighttime environment, shocking Squad 13. Han tells everyone to relax, they're gonna wait until their eyes adjust. Knut's team will head out and Jose's team will support them. Han, Jigo and Kuro will attack from the side. Squad 5 without Dimitri should be easy, but don't underestimate any opponent. Let's go. 10 minutes pass and the squads head out, and after 5 minutes, they are decimating squad 5. Han overlooks their unconscious bodies and thinks this is too easy and moves over to get the flag. But one man stands on top of it, the masked cadet, with his dual swords by his side. Why is he waiting there while his whole team was slaughtered? The man starts to get up and in the blink of an eye he takes out most of squad 13's members. Han is taken off guard and Kuro pushes him out of the way. He gets hit instead, sending him to the ground. Han looks at this new masked assailant and he must have some sort of teleportation ability. Han has no time to adjust. But as he swings, the man dashes back. Jigo tries to rush in, but the masked man leaps over him and kicks him in the head. We shift to the crowd, and Squad 13 was done in just like that. The masked guy has a nickname, Silence, and there's a rumor about this man. During his training, he was injured in his nervous system and lost the ability to speak. But from that incident, he started leveling up his ability fast and became a subject of experimentation from a soldier on level 3. And this must be the difference between level 2 and 3. Han doesn't stand a chance, as he manages to stand back up, looking at silence. I don't know who you are, but I don't have any intention of losing. Skeleton Mask. Han harnesses his power into his spear, and Silence gets into his stance, ready to teleport and finish off Han. Simon is watching on knowing that Silence is stronger than them at this point, and Han has no chance. The masked man sits in his stance, preparing his aura. Han looks on, if he can't block this next strike, he's gonna lose, but there's no way he's gonna give up. He thinks about what just happened. He can move about 50 feet in a single stroke, and if he loses energy in between strikes, there's no way he can do it twice in a row. Han's win condition isn't to beat Silence, but to take the flag. All he needs to do is block one strike. Han spots the first move as Silence's foot starts to move. He vanishes, leaving behind a purple haze. Han counts two steps, and on the third strike, he ducks under Silence's slash, shocking him to see that he missed. Han sends an upward strike that barely misses Silence. But the gap in skill shows, as Silence kicks Han down, trapping him, ready to end him. But Han starts to smile, because behind Silence is Han's sword falling down on him, smacking him on the head. He manages to regain himself, but he looks at Han holding their flag. You snapped back in 3 seconds, huh? Impressive. But it was more than enough time for me to get your flag. Looks like we win, Skull Mask. The gym starts to blow up. Han is so awesome. He won against the third year. But Simon grits his teeth in anger. We shift to Kuro feeding a cat, and he relates to this stray animal from his life as an orphan. He had no friends, but hey, look at him now. Where you start doesn't have to be where you end. Jigo thinks Kuro is a loser talking to a cat and scares a young boy. Jigo gets to the point. The squad doesn't have a second in command, and Jigo was hoping to fill that spot. But as he's explaining it, the cat rubs his leg and Jigo kicks the shit out of it in disgust. 
shocking Kuro. Jigo tries to get back to the conversation, but Kuro's power flares up. All of the items around him move as Kuro warns the man never to do that again. Kuro runs off to help the cat, leaving Jigo fearing for his life. We shift to Han visiting Dimitri in the hospital, and Dimitri asks why he's here. Han had his doubts, but after seeing his friend, he's sure that a third year did this to him. Dimitri grips the bed. It was the previous squad leader. Man, the gap from 2 and 3 is way different. Not just different, it's an insane power gap. Han looks over and he's never seen Dimitri so defeated. He couldn't even land a single finger on the guy. Dimitri remembers that something was off about him. He wasn't normal. Han thinks that this must be the result of the third year experimentation. Second year is pretty much the end of training. So whatever you do in year three is related to real battles. As the boys speculate what really happens in their next level, we see a man in a metallic suit exiting a room. But in front of the exit is the cat Kuro was chasing. Kuro finally catches up with it, but stands in front of this suited soldier, asking who the hell Kuro is. Kuro starts to sweat, but he remembers this voice. Sergeant Red? The man smiles and releases his mask. Oh. Hey Kuro, almost didn't recognize you for a second. Kuro ended up running to Ark's R&D facility. Chan asks what the kid is doing here. Are you lost? He takes off his suit and buys Kuro a drink, telling him that a car is coming to take him back to his dorm. Kuro is surprised. Aren't you mad? But John isn't angry at all. That psycho frame you saw is being released soon anyways, so it doesn't really matter. It's not like you can leave Ark. Kuro understands that right now him and his friends are property of Ark. John smacks Kuro on the head. He's not some jerk who gets mad at everything. That would make me ridiculous. Kuro is shocked at what he is experiencing, but an old man starts creeping behind him, asking John how the test went. John tells him to decrease the amount of dragon material. It's hard to control for the first generation guys. But for kids like Kuro, psychic manifestation is second nature. The man introduces himself as Charlie Smith, the chief of Team One. Kuro shakes his hand and John says that this man is responsible for designing all of the combat suits. Charlie starts ranting about the progress that he has made and these new frames will be like night and day compared to the first generation model. John tells Kuro that the suits are made for his class and he can barely move in them. Kuro takes it all in, that he's gonna wear this suit one day and end up fighting a war. The car comes to pick him up and John takes a hit of his cigar, asking Charlie what he does with the old models. Charlie of course plans to scrap them for the material, but John tells him to hold at least one. Some student might put it to good use. We shift back to Han and the typical day at ARC starts at 5 in the morning, but he wakes up at 4 to organize his thoughts and go over his team's strategy and grade his own ability. Still, his psychic power is lacking, but he's discovered a special skill, one that only he can use, super precision. He can control his abilities much better than anyone else. Kuro and Simon can crush a pencil into dust, but Han can write a book with that same pencil. And he has the best control out of everyone, so he needs to train even harder to make good use of it. But all of a sudden, his bracelet goes off. He meets his squad for their morning run, and Dimitri's squad is also on the track. The two greet each other, and Han asks Dimitri how the dimensional tear was. And we learn that this anomaly is a remnant of a gate that is closing after a Dragon Legion's attack. And the orders for the second years is to experience this sight. It might prove to be useful. Han heard that psychers get a strange sensation around it, and Dimitri says that he felt kind of fuzzy, and tells Han to go check it out for himself. Han regroups with his boys after the run, telling them to shower and eat, and to assemble at the helipad at 10. He dismisses them, and another man approaches, asking Han to have breakfast. And this is John, the strategist from Squad 10. And after Han handled silence, Grossman stopped trying to set them up. But eventually, Squad 13 did suffer some defeats, and Squad 10 was the first to do so. Han was actually meaning to talk to John to learn some things about his strategies. We shift to the helicopter trip, and the leading officer tells the cadets that they are headed to the Dimensional Gateway, and this is where the Dragon Legion spawned in from, and split to attack two targets. Korea and China. North Korea tried to rain nuclear bombs on the dragons, but all it did was kill their own civilians. South Korea took in all the refugees and defended the invasion, but it's still recovering from that attack. This is the place that Han and Jigo are from. The helicopter flies close to the tear and we see the purple and blue fissure appear in the ground. The hatch doors open and the cadets see this phenomenon. Han immediately starts to feel an intense pressure. It feels as if He's about to get swallowed up in any second. The helicopter turns around to return, and Squad 3 is happy to go back. That feeling was no joke. Han looks over at Squad 10's helicopter, and John winks back. But out of nowhere, the helicopter surges with purple energy, and blows up in mid-air, leaving Han stunned. Han is speechless. What just happened? Squad 10 was annihilated. He's brought back to reality by the commanding officer, telling him to get his men off the chopper. Now, this bird is about to blow up. Han quickly gets his team together to get off of the chopper, and they begin parachuting down. But as the man is explaining the orders, the helicopter explodes, sending Han flying out. Han wakes up, and he just saw the sergeant die right in front of him. 
but he managed to land safely. He starts to panic, but takes a deep breath. Keep a level mind. He gets back to the man that we all know. He's been training for situations like this. He needs to go towards the smoke pillars and check for survivors. Han cuts himself down, but sees someone in the bushes. But it's Jigo. He kept the eye on the chopper and knew Han was going to be the last one out and wanted to regroup with him. Han is impressed from his decision making and tells him that they need to find the others. They carve trees as they go and approach one of the crashed helicopters. They look inside but see all of Squad 10 cooked alive. Jigo throws up thinking what would have happened if he didn't escape and looks towards Han, wondering if he has any feeling. How is he so calm? This is not Han's first time seeing dead bodies and they need to move. But interrupting his thoughts, a minion of the dragons appears, a werewolf. Han prepares his knife and tells Jigo to get anything that they can use from that helicopter. They can't run, it's faster than they are. All they can do is fight. The werewolf lunges in, slashing at Han, sending its tendrils at his hand. Han tells Jigo to go, now, and the man dashes off. He wants to keep running as Han battles the werewolf. He dashes back, dodging its strike, but the beast winds its hand back to slash at Han, almost cutting the tree in half. Jigo approaches the chopper and he's scared to go inside, and he can use Han as bait, but he slaps himself in the face. Damn it, Jigo, you bastard. You're not a man who betrays his own comrades. He gets inside trying to find something that he can use. Han is getting pushed back as he is grabbed by the werewolf. But right before he's eaten, Jigo sends an object at the wolf with telekinesis and apologizes to Han and starts firing off more plates at the monster. This is all he can find and he throws the makeshift spear right next to Han. The werewolf turns his attention towards Jigo and pins him to the ground. But before it can finish him off, Han takes the spear and plunges it into the back of the monster's head, saving his cadet. Jigo tries to get up. This thing's dead, right? Please help me out. Han helps him up and thanks Jigo, and they walk off, hoping to meet a rescue squad. The rest of Han's men started a fire, and they're sure that Han will be able to find them with the smoke signal. Some other members from a different squad appear from the bushes, and they are from Squad 9. The instructor and squad leader from their squad died in the ambush, and they are the only survivors. And coming from behind the group is Han and Jigo. They are being attacked by three hunting type Elao who are controlling werewolves. The cadets have no idea what to do. They have no weapons. But Han takes control of the situation, telling everyone to calm down. He has a plan. Even if the rescue team is en route, they are hours away. They need to make a defensible position and wait this out. Two hours pass and the group is ready. This wouldn't have been possible for regular people. But for a group of psychers, it is. The cadets start to question Han's plan. And Inuk comes asking even if the rescue team comes, what will happen if that lightning strikes again? Han tells the boy that they cannot worry about that now. And this must be what real battles are like. This makes their training look like child play. A group hears a howl from the forest and everyone gets into position. Han tells Kuro to use his ability and the boy flares up his aura, creating a barrier around the fortress. Jose is shocked. When did Kuro get this strong? A werewolf starts to approach and Han calls out for the javelin group and for his own team to move in. The javelin throwers will launch wooden spears with their telekinesis. They fire and all four of them hit their target. Han follows up but the beast retaliates and smacks Canute into a rock. Another beast approaches but falls for a trap, getting pierced by wooden spikes. Han asks Kuro where the next enemies are coming from, and two more are approaching from 12 o'clock. Jose is ordered to light the barricade, stopping their assault, and Han orders the javelin throwers to fire, taking them out one by one. As one of the wolves tries to jump over the fire, he is shot down almost immediately, and his body plunges into the fire. Only one left, and as it approaches, four javelins are thrown, but the werewolf blocks it with its hard spine. It's trying to bait out the spears. Han grabs the spear from one of the men and calls for Jigo and rushes in. He's going to make sure that this beast will open its mouth. As Han stabs its foot, the beast yells out in pain and Jigo pierces its head. Kuro yells for Jigo to watch out and Han pulls the boy back. Jigo laughs but a purple beam hits him in the stomach, sending him to the ground. Kuro tells Han that arrows are being fired at them and Han knows that the Alao hunters are here and tells Kuro to give him their positions. Han has one last trick up his sleeve, a three-man guerrilla unit, as we see them perched up in the trees. The Alao hunters only reveal themselves when they think victory is assured, and at that very moment, he ordered his three-man unit to jump on the wooden planks and use them as air bits, and as soon as Kuro locates them, he will guide them to the hunters, and they will get neutralized before they can get their barriers, as we see the three-man unit decimate the hunters. Kuro begins to drop feeling exhausted with blood streaming down his nose. Han and his men have exhausted all of their resources, and if any more enemies appear, they need to retreat. 
but to Han's horror, another pack of werewolves lurk in the forest. The wolf pack starts to encircle the cadets. Han assumes that one of these must be the leader. And just like that, he spots it. A white fang. A werewolf with a higher intelligence. A black substance starts to envelop Han. Despair. The werewolves begin to howl, and just as Han starts to give up, he tears away the threads that are binding him. They can make it out of this alive. He tells his men to retrieve their spears, and Kuro tries to draw out every ounce of his power. The cadets use telekinesis to retrieve their spears, but as the wolf lunges at them, a soldier in a metal suit appears. John arrived just in time, telling Han it's a miracle that he survived. We shift to the next day as Jose lifts his hand to the sky. Canute says that they were lucky. Half of the guys died that day. Jose can't help but admire that psycho frame. It took them everything they had to kill those wolves, but John came in there and made it look easy. Even though the situation was dire, everyone was happy to be alive. But Han stood there lost in his own thoughts. And ever since they came back, all the inter-squad conflicts became meaningless. Kato approached Han telling him that he hated his guts, but now he's happy to see him. And Han was right. Kato wasn't ready to kill anyone or see anybody die. And now he knows who their real enemy is. Han clenches his fist and he knows the difference in power between the dragons and himself. He needs to get stronger. But interrupting his thoughts, someone sends a punch through the wall. And from his bracelet, Han Lee is called. Turns out that it was silence and this guy really doesn't like doors apparently. Han is being escorted and asked who summoned him. And silence presses some buttons on his bracelet iPad thingy saying that John did and stop asking questions. Han thinks that maybe Silence doesn't like him because of their match. The two approach John and we see Simon there as well. John tells the boy to sit and we see a flashback to the instructor's meeting. A quarter of the second year is tied, a heavy loss of assets to Ark. The commanding officer for this operation will be held responsible and with that the meeting is over. Grossman was the one in charge and he's taking the heat for this. The instructors reviewed the incident and the cadets were raided by an allow mage. And these mages have the ability to open gates. And this is the first time that they are attacked like this. Most of the lower ranked monsters were dealt with. But this means that there is a higher chance that a war will break out soon. Maybe it's time to wake the oracle. This news alerts John. We shift back to the present and John is assigning Han and Simon to a new squad. Codename W. They can choose between White and Whiskey as the squad name. The two look at each other and Silence talks first, picking White, and it seems that he's a part of the squad as well. Simon and Han both agree, but John tells them that they're going to go with Whiskey. He sits back in the sofa and starts debriefing their assignment. We shift back to the instructor's meeting and it seems they need the so-called Oracle, if they want to stand a chance. Recor asks John what he thinks and he offers to put a team together to see if they can capture this so-called mage. John reiterates this order to Han and Simon. They need to capture and allow Mage to get information. And this news shocks the boys. But before they move out, Octo arrives and has the boys pick some dragon material weapons. Han grabs a spear, but all of a sudden, the blade emanates with aura. These weapons store psychic energy. Simon, looking at his, asks if there's something longer and more slim. But Octo starts to get mad. These weapons aren't made just like that. This is a rare material. Use whatever you can and return them once you're done. Octo then unveils another gadget as a hovering sphere floats in front of the boys. Each member gets two of these, a lightweight pocket-sized air pit. Han suits up with all his gear and the squad of four moves out. They arrive at the closest point and now they will continue on foot. Operation Catching Wizard. The squad rolls out looking badass, might I add, and we flash back to Han asking why he was chosen for this mission. John says that sure, a third year might be more experienced, but Han is much better at leading an operation. He survived against a horde of enemies without any equipment and didn't have a single casualty. And that's not his only strength. Most of the survivors are suffering from psychological trauma, and that's the fate of the situation. Humans are bound to collapse. But Han is here, unfazed, and the only thing he is lacking is field experience. And that's why himself and Simon were chosen. We flash back to Simon watching Han defeat Silence, and it seems he has his own reason to get stronger as well. John calls for his group to hold their position, and they will camp out here and take turns sleeping. Han looks over at the forest that he was just in defending. There's some members of his squad that didn't make it, and they're probably not alive. Silence is next to Han, attempting to remove his mask, and Han says that he'll face the other way, so take it off. But Silence's face turns into a screen, mocking Han again. Some time passes and John is ready to move out. Communication won't work here on out, so switch to the local squad network. Silence sees allow recons and they're getting closer. John tells the two cadets to hold their fire. They will leave this up to Silence, as he decapitates them both in a flash. The word end appears on his mask, and John smiles. That bastard even programmed that. He's even more powerful than Han originally thought. But interrupting the fun, more enemies approach. Two more recons. But before Silence can take them out, Han thinks it would be better for them to follow. They are off guard and heading back towards the tear. Maybe they're going back to their base. 
John thinks that Han has a good point, and Simon starts to get angry. He only thought of killing them. Simon curses Han, and he's gonna show him. Just wait. They follow the recons for some time as they approach the mage. John alerts his squad to the crystal on the staff of the mage. It's a psychic crystal. They heard about it in their lessons. It's an ore that can store massive amounts of energy, and this is what was used to attack the helicopters. And looking at it, it probably only has one more shot left. The enemy base has a mage with six guards. There's no wolves around, and John orders his squad to join Silence. The operation is a go. The allow mage can teleport, so Silence will focus on her, and the rest will handle the guards. Mistakes will not be tolerated. Han wonders what's in front of the altar, but is horrified to see his cadet's corpses laid out, the members of his squad no less. John sees Han start to let off energy and wonders why. At this rate, the mage will detect their presence. John sees no other option and thinks to tell his squad to retreat. The mage shouldn't have caught on just yet. But just as he thinks this, Han's energy spikes and the mage turns around, alerted to their location. John hits Han out of the way, dodging the huge blast, and John was injured in this attempt and tells Han to take over as commander. John yells at Han, asking if he came back to his senses yet, and Han grabs John, ready to retreat, cursing himself. The recons start chasing, but Silence starts fighting them. Simon gives support fire, but the recons block with their shields. Simon uses his telekinesis to lift two boulders and smacks two of the recons, but more are leaping on to his position. Is this how I die? But just before the recons can reach him, Silence quickly kills them, saving Simon's life. Simon just wonders how the hell Han ever beat this guy. The mage starts chanting, and no more minions are chasing. They retreat, and Han starts cursing himself. Silence starts beating Han around, and it seems John has lost one of his legs. John says that they need to retreat, but Han stands up. No, they can't. They have to keep going. Silence gets up and kicks Han, but Simon tries to grab him and reminds Silence that Han is the commander right now. Silence lets go and Han regains himself. If his plan is lousy, he will be sending them to their deaths. Simon will hear Han out at the very least. He is the best strategist in their class. Han says that the situation isn't that bad, and Silence starts to get angry. Now the mage has no more ammunition and can't teleport. All the energy is depleted. Han thinks that this mage hasn't shown its face in a decade. Think about it. It tried to kill us, even if it meant using all of its energy, and called the warriors back to protect itself, rather than to chase them. Why would the mage do that if it can teleport? The two cadets nod and Han starts telling them the plan. Han stands in front of the tear, gripping his lightweight air bits. He's gonna capture this mage and ambush it from the other side of the tear. He needs the other two to distract the other forces. The mage can detect their energy, but it's gonna be hard while Han is inside of the rift. But that aside, the pressure from inside the rift is immense, and Simon wonders if Han can even handle it. He can die with the slightest mistake. Han is confident with his psychic control. He's not doing this to make up for what happened. He's doing this because this is the best chance to pull off the plan. Simon and Silence walk, and Simon knows that Han must have saw the pile of his dead squad members, and he may seem cold, but not everyone can feel nothing after seeing something like that, especially seeing his comrades brought together like that. And he was still focused enough to come up with another plan. This is the reason Squad 13 placed their trust in him. Han arrives at his location and takes off the unnecessary gear. He overlooks the rift and knows that failure means death. He pulls out his air bits and the 15 minute mark is up. It's time to start. Han begins traversing the rift and Simon and Silence start their assault. There are more guards this time around, but Silence begins mowing them down, with Simon providing cover fire. Simon is taking some down and snipes one that's right behind Silence. The two nod at each other and Simon prays that Han pulls through. He doesn't want his first mission to end in failure. Han is getting across but the pressure is starting to get to him. This is Dragon Fear. Han holds himself together. This isn't real. Don't hesitate. He bites down on his fingers and goes through the dragon's mouth. Simon in silence almost dealt with all of the guards and only two remain. They are protecting the mage. But right as Simon tries to shoot, the mage protects her minions by putting up barriers. They have a dense defense. But from the shadows, Han appears from the mage's back and body slams her into the ground, injecting her with the paralyzing agent. Simon and Silence take the cue and rush in. The mage begins to teleport, causing Han to panic. But the syringe he injected started to work, and the mage is passed out. The mission was a success. We shift back to Ark as Han looks over John. John tells him to stop looking at him like some sort of puppy. This isn't nothing that a prosthetic can't take care of. And he can probably get some disability checks when he retires. So stop apologizing, kid. John tells Han it was right of him to continue the mission. And thanks to that, they captured the mage. John is finishing up his reports and Han questions if it is even possible to interrogate these beings. But at Ark, it is. A psyker that specializes in telepathy. There's only one in the world. John tells Silence to stop waiting by the door and come in already, and the man comes in asking how John is feeling, but he just smiles. I was planning to lose some weight anyway, so now I'm like a leg lighter. Silence starts laughing and Han can't believe that Silence is actually talking with John. 
John soon kicks the two out, telling them that he needs to mourn his missing leg. Both of them walk out and Silence apologizes to Han. He would have done the same in his shoes. Han smiles but he knows that he deserved it. He put everyone in danger. Silence now knows why John has such high hopes for Han. Han just jokes that it's hard to tell if John even likes anybody and this makes Silence laugh. The two walk for a bit and part ways. Before Han leaves, Silence throws a rock at him and gives him a message. You better get to the third year already, kid. The next chapter begins with some corporate guys getting out of a plane. We have an ambassador from the US and Recor is informed that the Supreme Council inspectors have arrived. All the officials are given special bracelets and escorted to the main building. The US rep, James, takes the bracelet and says that he's fine. He wants to move at his own pace. The soldiers can't really argue and they think that James is going to be a pain in the ass. But James turns around asking where he can find Han Lee. We shift to this guy meeting Han's squad with a lot of snacks ready for them. James tells the boys that there's a lot more where that came from and he brought it because technically they're still young. Han tells the inspector that they need to train and the inspector stops bothering Han's squad and thinks that this must be Han. Nothing noteworthy was written about him in the first year, but now he's become quite famous from how he handled the tear incident. James is chilling by a gate and starts to yawn. No matches are going on and most of the squads are taking breaks, but Han's squad doesn't take one day off. James sees them exit the training arena and Han orders them to get to the weapons training gym. James is impressed. He continues to watch as Han calls for Kuro to spar with him today. The two take their stance as Kuro is nervous. Why does Han want to spar me? He doesn't look like himself. Han thinks that he learned an important lesson in his mission. In a real fight, just having psychic powers won't be enough. Kuro needs to improve his physical combat. He's a boy with a man's body, so he needs to improve his mentality. Han charges in and Kuro activates his ability. He dodges the first strike and blocks the barrage, but he can't catch his breath. Han quickly disarms Kuro and wins the spar, telling him that even if he has foresight, he can't win by only defending. He needs to attack. Attack me, Kuro. The boy shuts his eyes and charges in, but Han quickly disarms him again, and he tells Kuro that he needs to have his eyes open when he attacks, and to have a tighter grip on his spear. Han tells Kuro to attack again, with everything that he's got. All of the cadets turn to see what happens. Kuro's chest starts to pound, but Han warns the boy, from this point forward, Han won't go easy on him. What's the matter, Kuro? Are you scared you're gonna hurt me? Kuro doesn't know why Han is acting like this, but flares up his powers. He's gonna go all out, and he's gonna trust Han. Instructor Wei asks Han what he wanted to see him about, and offers the boy some oolong tea. Han tries to hide the fact that he absolutely hates it, and Wei laughs, but Han gets to the point. He came here about Kuro. The boy lacks ferocity, and always hesitates before he attacks. Han is worried that this trait will get him killed. Wei smiles and says that some people are bound to have different emotional distance. A grizzled soldier might have a hard time killing a civilian with his bare hands, but even a civilian can pilot a drone with a bomb attached to it. What Kuro needs is motivation. Han unzips his jacket ready to fight Kuro. Jose and Knut watch on and James is also interested in this match. Han looks at Kuro and is impressed with his psychic power. Kuro starts to fight by sending spears at Han, but he easily catches one. The speed on these is quite slow, and it honestly would be faster if the boy just threw them. Han asks if Kuro is going easy on him. Han rushes in at Kuro, who tries to intercept him with his spears, but Han is closing the gap. Kuro, in a last ditch effort, sends every spear at Han at once, but Han uses his own power to strengthen his jacket, and uses it as a shield and slides under it. Everyone is shocked, and Kuro is nervously gripping his spear. He tries to lunge, but Han breaks his spear with ease and bonks him on the head. At least this time, he kept his eyes open. Han tells Kuro that his biggest weakness is that he's soft, and he even tried to send all the spears at Han's stomach. If he fired them at random, Han could have got injured in his arms or legs. So this is why Kuro fired them at his stomach. James is watching on, impressed, thinking that maybe he could get some info out of this boy. He jumps down and asks if he can borrow Han for just a second. The two sit by a bench and James tries his ability, which isn't a psychic power, super reactions. If he could say the right thing at the right time, he might be able to squeeze insider information out of Han. But just as he's getting to the climax, Han ends the story. He only told James exactly what was in his report, and Han's face didn't change even once. James thinks that this boy is smarter than he thought, as he sees him go back to training. Han thinks to himself that he needs to keep all of his squad's information confidential. James looks on and opens his phone to make a call. He's having this man check if Han has been in Ark the entire time after the tear incident. We see Han running with his squad with Dimitri not far behind. An instructor from Russia is watching, so Dimitri needs to be active. He's been followed around by this guy all day, and he keeps telling Dimitri that he needs to fight for their mother country once this war is over. Han doesn't understand, but Dimitri tells him that once the war with the dragons is over, humans will wage war on each other to control the world. And this news shocks Han. The boys are training hard with Han overseeing. He just can't help but think on what Dimitri said. Even if they defeat the world's greatest threat, 
peace will still be unattainable. But interrupting his thoughts, James busts into the room. The man knows that Han wasn't at Ark and had to be on a secret mission, and today he's gonna find out, as two men come behind him. Han sees a message pop up and alerts all of his men through the bracelets. They stare at James thugs menacingly, and Han restrains James. And the bodyguards try to pull out their guns, but Kuro uses his power to break their hands. Han tells James that, that from this moment on, he's gonna be under Squad 13's protection. They have been given orders. But interrupting this, a huge rumble shakes the building. They are under attack. Raid warning, take control and protect the inspectors. James sees this notification, and Squad 13 prepares themselves. Kuro asks who the enemy is, but he's informed that it's other humans. Han restrains James and his thugs and gears up. He uses his bracelet to communicate with the other squad leaders, asking how many guards each instructor has. James watches on and sees how Han is instantly accepted as the leader of all squads. Han calls in for everybody to gather at the 4th simulation Battle Dome, bringing all their combat gear. Han escorts the team to that location and as they walk, Han tells James that due to how he reacted to the message, he assumes that he isn't a spy. James smiles and tells Han that this is the work of the pure humanists. This is a group that believes in the annihilation of psychers, who to them aren't human. Knuth doesn't understand how they could do this when the dragons are about to invade. Do they want everyone to die? Apparently this group thinks that if every psyker dies, the dragons will stop. But psychers only appeared after the threat arrived, so that theory doesn't make much sense. We see a helicopter hovering above, with many more hovering behind, and they start unloading on the campus. Ark's defenses activate and start shooting down some of the enemy aircrafts. Han thinks that he is approaching the battlefield, as he sees a helicopter crash nearby. Han thinks that some enemies are bound to be nearby, and Knut spotted four. Han wanted to avoid a fight, but it might be inevitable. He tells his squad that from here on out, they might have to kill other people. The battle rages on and both sides are losing men quickly. The pure humanists are driven by their hatred for psychers, and they'll throw their own lives away to kill even one. James looks around and most of the kids in Han's squad don't look ready for this, except Knut. Han recognizes this as well and takes the blonde boy with him ahead. Psychers are stronger than the humanists, but in terms of murder, the humanists are veterans. We see James have a small knife, seemingly to cut out of his bindings. Knut and Han move out and Han asks if he will be alright. Knut has no choice and he'll have to think of them as deer. But this situation brings back bad memories for Han, as we shift back to South Korea. Han was trying to steal some food and he was running towards a train, but was grabbed right at the last second. Before the train hits him, he kicks the man, sending him into the incoming train, killing him. Back to the present, Han and Knut see the battlefield and the two move out, and Han looks to use his air bits. He floats his jacket into a nearby building and the humanists fall for the trap, lighting it up. Knut takes advantage of the situation and shoots one of the men down. The other humanist tries to take out Knut, but Han was ready to intercept. The man Knut shot isn't dead yet, and Knut closes his eyes, but Han tells him to keep them open as he finishes the humanist off. Han asks if the boy is okay, and he says he is. We shift back to James looking at the very nervous Kuro, wondering what he's looking at. But thanks to that, he managed to untie his bindings. But Kuro is still worried on their flank, something's coming. But suddenly, a humanist turns the corner, and Kuro yells for everyone to get down. James steals Kuro's gun and shoots the humanist down. Another one flanks them, shooting at James, but Kuro protects him with a barrier, and then James finishes off that humanist as well. James asks if that's all the enemies, and Kuro says that it is. James tells Kuro that his power is amazing, and hands him back his gun. Han sees this, but knows what's going on. The group needs to move out. We see a group of humanists blow the doors off a bunker, ready to dive into the rat's nest. We see the humanist leader yelling a speech to his men. Psychers are the one who cause their problems. Without them, the dragons won't invade. They've been gone for 10 years. These psychers are only being trained to control the world. Let the purge begin. We see Han group up with the other squads in the simulation dome. One of the inspectors starts to yell, but is grabbed by Simon, who tells him to shut the fuck up. He knows why they're doing this. One of them is responsible for this attack, a fucking traitor. Simon's aura flares up and the man shits himself, but Han tells Simon that that's enough. Protecting these people is also one of their duties. Simon looks and walks away. We shift to Instructor Wei being badass defending the weapons training arena, but he is injured defending the young cadets behind him. He looks towards his bracelet and calls out for Han. We shift back to Squad 13 rushing to Wei's position. They need to protect the first years. Wei told Han that the humanists are headed for the shelter. Their target is all of the young kids. Han knows that they are vulnerable and they need to rush to protect them. If they are late, 
they all could die. The humanists kill another instructor, but are having a hard time maneuvering the shelter. Han hears some radio static, and the squad found enemies in the entrance to the shelter, and they're engaging. The humanists don't have heavy weapons, so Han asks Simon if he can block their fire. Simon takes the lead and the group charges in to a barrage of bullets. Simon blocks all of the shots and yells for his own squad to open fire, while he blinds all of the humanists. They are taken out with ease and one of the men is still alive, cursing these mutant bastards, but he is quickly put out of his misery by Canute. Han tells him to calm down, more are inside. He looks towards the men that he chose for his squad and he tells them that they all have things in common, but please take this advice. I learned the hard way the consequences of being carried away by emotion, and I won't make that same mistake again. Starting now, suppress all of your anger, otherwise the entire squad will be in danger. We shift back to Han laying out the plan to all the other squads, and the science leader is telling them to get to their locations. Dimitri asks Han if he can do something on his own and leave the second in command in charge, and Han lets him. And we see Dimitri enter the psychiatric ward, looking at the man who hospitalized him. Dimitri tells him that whoever is in his head is on our side. Snap out of it. The man turns. Do you think Ark is really on your side? You wouldn't know until you're put into real missions. As third years, I have experienced unimaginable fear. Every bone in my body was telling me that we can never win. This must be dragon fear. The man continues. We are nothing more than pawns to Ark. Pawns that are expendable. It'd be a waste to not do anything with us, so what they do when a cadet isn't sufficient is recycle. They restrict their bodies and use drugs to control their minds. And Ark isn't the only one doing this. All of the major governments are after the same thing, one way or another. The psychers will only be ever used as tools. It's useless to risk your life to protect this shitty race. Dimitri smiles and unzips his jacket. He doesn't like Ark either, but he has a family to return to. But first, they need to kill those fucking dragons. And after that, they can kill whoever stands in their way. We shift back to Han's team who is down in the shelter. Han tells another squad that the enemy is headed towards them, but we see one of the humanists load a grenade launcher. Han is maneuvering the shelter but notices something and telling everyone to stop. A trap. A grenade strapped to a wire. Han thinks that maybe Kuro should have came with. The humanist leader opens up the shelter doors and tells his men to kill all of the kids. The humanist leader wants to show no mercy. These kids will rule the world. One of his men starts to protest. Killing unarmed children is not what he signed up for, but he is shot dead by the leader instantaneously. History will determine the righteousness of their actions. We do what we must. We shift back to Han's squad and Canute is hit in his leg trying to pass a corridor. Han tells Simon to cover him and they peek the corner together. A humanist holds up a grenade launcher and Simon can't put up a shield fast enough. As the grenade is fired towards them, Han uses his control to grab the grenade and throw it back on the humanists, blowing them up. Han uses this opportunity to rush in, taking care of the rest. Han overhears the voice comms between the humanists and Shelter A has been cleared, heading to Shelter D now. We shift back to Dimitri as he's fighting the third year, but is getting crushed. He's sent into the wall and punched hard into the stomach, making him cough up blood. The man grabs a spear and fills it with energy, telling Dimitri that sometimes there are people you can't beat, no matter how hard you try. But as he tries to whack Dimitri, the spear dissolves. Dimitri's psychic power spikes, and he never understood how he ever lost to a coward like this. We go back to Han's squad and we see Canute sitting in the hallway with his injured leg. We flash back to when he built a raft in the island survival, and how excited Han was to have him in his squad. Canute thinks that he's failed to meet any of his team's expectations, and even now he's been left behind. He curses his own weakness. We shift back to the battle simulation dome and the humanists are attacking the position. One man starts to throw a grenade, but a psyker manages to divert it into the air. The humanists are not gaining any ground. They're running out of time. The Ark soldiers will be here soon. The cadets are gaining morale and Han's plan is working. They just need to stall until help arrives. We shift back to the shelter as the humanists are cracking the next door. Their men are being killed. We see Han running through the labyrinth and sees the location of the leader. Before he turns the corner to the next humanist squad, he tells his men to halt and go over the plan. The battle is raging on. An unnamed bomber is headed towards the fourth simulation dome. And this looks dire. We shift back to Han's plan and he wants to maneuver through the vents that lead to Shelter D so they can reach the kids before the humanists do. Simon thinks that this plan has a high chance of casualty, but Han doesn't see another option. He has to save those kids. But Knut walks up and it seems that now he is needed. Simon compliments his healing factor skill and now we shift to Knut traveling through the vents. He starts making noise inside of the vent, taking the attention away from the humanists. Han turns the corner with his squad at that very second, blasting the humanists 
that are distracted. Simon uses his power to block the incoming fire, but Knut is shot out of the vents. Both sides are at a standstill, and Han needs to stop them now, but Knut stands up, battered and bloody, asking what these guys think they're doing. Do you know how annoying it is to sit out because you're a burden? Knut's body turns green, and his healing factor kicks in, and he says that this is awesome. He raises up his weapon, and we shift back to Kuro defending the dome. But he gets a chilling vision as he sees the jet coming to bomb them. He looks up and says that it's a good thing that Han is in here to die. Kuro looks up at the jet, sending multiple rockets at their position. The instructors are in despair. This is an air raid. James and Jose look up concerned. Kuro thinks that life at Ark was no joke, but he doesn't want to go back to what he had before. He thanks Han for what he did. It's good that you're not here. You shouldn't die in a place like this. But interrupting Kuro's thoughts is Han yelling at him to never give up. Kuro's power surges and he manifests a hand out of psychic energy to block all of the incoming missiles, causing them to explode in midair. James is in awe. He has never seen or heard anything like this. For energy to take shape like that, the instructor who was a spy sees this and now knows that these monsters should not be allowed to exist. He grabs his gun from his jacket and aims it at Kuro. We shift back to Han telling Knut to open his eyes. Can you hear me? Knut wakes up but tells Han that he's fine. Han tells him that it worked out this time but that was way too reckless. We don't even know how far your power goes. Han helps Knut up but the first year's evacuation zone is clear, along with zone A and B, the gym, and the battle simulation dome. It seems the battle is over. Three days pass and Han is seen overlooking the city from a rooftop. James approaches asking how the boy is doing. He says he's fine but he couldn't sleep without medication, and some guys are still in critical condition. It's hard for them to suppress their murderous intent. Han saw a lot of dead first years who had no chance to protect themselves. They might be considered monsters, but they were just kids. This will only further the future of the humanists fear, causing psychers to feel hatred towards them. James gets a chill, but Han relaxes his serious look. He doesn't want something like that to happen. James is shocked that the man in front of him is only a teenager, and what Kuro did genuinely scared him. But Han is on a different level. Han thanks James for saving Kuro, and in the end, James ended up saving Kuro before he was shot while he was passed out. And James himself dealt with the traitor. Now, the higher ups are gonna have a hard time doing anything about Ark. Han, you must think it's all or nothing in this war against the dragons. If we survive that, where will these new weapons be pointed at each other? That's why James is here, to protect the interests of his country. He knows it's hard to hear this, but that's the truth. But as James walks away, Han coldly tells him that that's a cowardly excuse. If you know something is a mistake, these words scare James as he leaves. This incident, along with the dimensional tear, caused major damage to Ark. The majority of the first years died, and those who survived dropped out. The second years had to undergo psychological training. We see Han walking the halls and he spots silence. He was the only one promoted to third year after this battle.